Hey everybody, Paul Rabelais, estate planning attorney, Paul Rabelais here again, and welcome to another edition of Estate Planning Live. Came up with that name, hope you like it. Uh, I've been an estate planning attorney for 31 years, been hanging around here on, hanging around here on YouTube for six years or so. A lot of activity, a lot of videos on my channel, Rabelais Estate Planning, feel free to check that out at your convenience. Few rules before we get started on today's topic, which is a tax move to consider when your spouse passes away. We'll be talking about something called the portability election. But a couple of quick rules. Um, if you are a channel subscri subscriber, there's no reason not to be a subscriber. Hit the notification bell. It doesn't cost anything. You get updated when I post new video content. Um, but if you are a subscriber, you can you can chat just like uh, Kelsa or Celsa, Kel Kelsa Valdez did. Hey, from New Jersey. Hello back to you. So um, uh, subscribers can chat, keep those chat questions and comments clean, positive construction, constructive, and just know that when you do ask a question in the chat, I'm not giving one-on-one -on -one legal advice. We're not creating an attorney-client relationship. The, the questions, I don't always just simply answer the question because when I see a question, hey, Stephen, from your neighbor, hello from your neighbor in Texas. Yeah, I'm here in Louisiana. I mean, it is a serious thunderstorm event going on here and and uh, in Louisiana probably came from from your area, Stephen, in Texas. Things seems to move that way. But um, yeah, when I see a question, it, it I generally just answer it in a way that can can help everyone. It it may not address the person specific issue that was asked in the chat, because to, to really address a person's unique situation I need, I need to ask a lot more questions than what I see in the chat. So just be aware, no, uh, no really no one-on-one -on -one legal advice um, there. All right, so here, let's just jump right in. Uh, Christine, glad to have you. I fell on this love list of love sharing the information and love that you love listening and learning. So um, big one today, kind of an unknown. It's, it's a real, whew, it's a trap. Uh, is what it is. Um, and so this is why learning is so important because if you don't, if you aren't aware of some of these kind of intricate rules that people don't talk about in the grocery store, they don't talk about it at the, at the, at the barber shop or in the coffee shop, never is, is port the portability election on an, on an estate tax return discussed in any of those settings. But it is a significant thing that can help you do exactly what you're trying to do. Preserve what you have, avoid paying unnecessary tax to the government. So it's an important issue. And we're going to be kind of fairly, fairly quick today. All right. Uh, and what I do is I, I give you some content. I look at the chat, see what's there. Uh, Bob, hi from D.C. Sometime maybe you could talk about non-judicial settlement agreements when beneficiaries agree they want to do something else with trust assets. So, yeah, that's a great you know, that, that one's a writer downer. I'm going to keep that one. So sometimes beneficiaries or parties to an irrevocable trust um, will form an agreement to perhaps alter the terms of that trust. So great question there. Hey, from Nebraska, Cynthia, and hey, from Georgia, Wimmer Jim, back again. Good to see you. All right. Um, so here's, here's the deal. Let me just jump right in, pose an example. Let's say one spouse uh, dies and that spouse has an estate of, let's call it $2 million. And then let's let's call that the wife. Wife dies, has it could be the husband, we could go either way. I'll, I'll, I'll just, wife dies with a $2 million estate. Husband has his own $10 million estate. How he got 10 and she got two could be any number of ways could be inheritance, could be not a community property state, could be any number of things. But just bottom line, wife has two million, husband has 10 million, wife dies. OK, so now they're going through the checklist of the things they got to do. Everybody's grieving. It's a tough time. Uh, the wife passed away. The children are grieving. The husband's grieving. They're having to deal with either living trust issues or probate issues um, just depending upon how wife set up her estate plan. And so somebody, somebody comes up and says, Hey, there's, is there any, uh, of this death tax due? A lot of people call it a death tax. Um, and then the conversation turns to, yeah, there, I, I think there's this estate tax or an inheritance tax. 
And upon a little bit of further inquiry, they realized that because wife died in the year 2022, uh, there's a basic exclusion amount or estate tax exemption of $12.07 million. So everybody just laughs that off. Oh, geez, uh, I, I wish we had that problem is what is what they'd say, or nice problem to have is what they'd say. But they say, oh, we don't have to worry about that. Let's move on to the to the next item that we, we have to deal with. What are we going to do with mom's car? So they just going to blow off the whole um, estate tax discussion because there is no estate tax return filing requirement. The estate tax rules say if when someone dies, their gross estate is, exceeds the exemption amount. So if their gross estate exceeds $12.07 million, if they die in 2022, then there's a requirement that a federal estate tax return, it's called IRS Form 706, there's a requirement that that, that return be filed with the IRS within nine months after the day that wife died. But here, wife died $2 million. Eh, move on. Okay, so that's that's what happens there. And then, uh, remember, husband, he's on the sitting on the side here with this ten million dollar estate, and he keeps on living, and he keeps on working, and his estate keeps on growing. And he dies maybe ten years later, maybe five years later, maybe fifteen years later. It doesn't really matter. But when he dies, let's say his estate grew to from ten when wife died to eighteen million when husband died, grew from 10 to 18. And so now when husband dies, there is a boatload of estate tax due based on 40% of the fair market value of husband's estate, less whatever the applicable exemption amount at the time husband passes away, maybe 10 years later. So let, let's say when the husband dies, there's a $6 million exemption. He had an $18 million estate. And so $12 million subject to tax at 40%, about $5 million after husband dies, kids are writing out a check to the IRS for $5 million. And so that's, that's how that worked under that scenario. Now, let's say they, they knew a little bit more than what they knew. Maybe they watched, watched this video in advance. And now wife dies with a $2 million estate. And now someone who's relatively informed, when that discussion comes up, hey, is there any estate tax consequences here? Hey, is there a death tax? Hey, is there an inheritance tax? Hey, do we, do we have to file anything with the IRS? Somebody, maybe the husband, maybe one of the children, or maybe the attorney who was handling things, if there was an attorney, was sophisticated enough. And don't assume all attorneys know everything about estate tax and all the regulations, but somebody steps up and says, wait a second here. I saw something about how important it is to, to consider filing an estate tax return when a spouse dies, even when the IRS says you don't have to file a return. So what they do is wife dies with her $2 million estate. It's under 12 million by a lot. So there's no requirement that, a, that an estate tax return be filed. However, the husband does file a return. He gets it prepared and he files it within nine months after the wife's death. And on that return, even though it wasn't required to be filed, he makes what's called a portability election. This was this is something that's been around for about 10 years, but not well known because it's, you know, when it applies, it's humongous, but uh, not everybody deals with it. So by making what's called the portability election on wife's IRS Form 706, Federal Estate Tax Return. You see, the wife only had a $2 million estate, but she had a $12 million exemption. So she only used $2 million of her $12 million exemption. Her, she did not use $10 million of her estate tax exemption, but by the husband filing an estate tax return on behalf of his wife's estate and making what's called the portability election, the husband then transfers his wife's unused exemption amount to himself. So in this case, she died with a $2 million estate. There was a $12 million exemption. $10 million of the exemption was unused. By filing an estate tax return and showing 
the assets that existed when wife died and showing that they totaled $2 million and making the portability election. Um, now, when husband dies five years later, 10 years later, 20 years later, with a hypothetical $18 million estate, he'll have his own estate tax exemption. Let's call that $6 million. But he'll also have his wife's unused estate exemption amount. She didn't use 10 million. So now he gets to exempt his exemption, 6 million plus her unused 10 million. He gets to exempt $16 million from the 40% estate tax. That estate, that filing of the estate tax return and making the portability, portability election probably saved that family about $5 million of estate tax. Thanks, Cheryl, for the comment. Fantastic information. Thank you. Okay. So um, that's that's where we are. Just That's the idea of the portability election. It sneaks up on people because a spouse dies and there's no requirement. Uh, you might think, why would I want to report a bunch of information to the IRS when it's not required? That doesn't seem to make sense. But in this particular case, it makes a lot of sense. Um, that when one spouse dies, even though there's no requirement to file, uh, the filing can can call can enable the surviving spouse's estate to save significant 40% estate tax. Okay, a couple of things to note. This is really a situation only for married couples. If you have a, a life partner, someone you're living with, there's the portability election is not available. So here's where you know, being married is a is 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 more tax advantageous at tax advantageous than shacking up with somebody. And know that this has been around. I mentioned earlier, it has been around for about ten years. Um, good question, Louis uh, Perez. If you elect portability now, can it be taken away by Congress later? Who I always kind of get the little shimmies when somebody says, "What's Congress going to do later?" Because I got no idea. <laughs> so. <laughs> Um, Congress does what they want to do, but I, I will say there's a pattern of, of um, most things that Congress enact from a, from a tax perspective generally apply prospectively towards, you know, based on current and future rather than prospectively or retroactively what happened in the past. But that's, uh, but let me get to this point in a second because you're, we're, we're thinking alike. All right. Um, so really what the portability does, it, it used to be where spouses had to do all these maneuvers during their lifetime to try to equalize the value of the estate. So if wife had two and husband had 10, he would contribute some of his to her. So it was equal to make sure that when the first one died, the first one to die, use as much of their estate tax exemption as possible. All that's really not necessary anymore because of this portability election, which which is intended to simplify the, the estate tax planning and provide married couples with a mechanism to use both spouses' exemptions, even when the estate of the first spouse to die does not meet the exemption amount. Here's the beautiful part, and um, and it goes to, to, I guess, Mr. Perez's question there. They have come out with regulations because we know that this $12.07 million exemption, which gets adjusted every year for inflation, we know that with no congressional action, it's going to be cut in half in 2026. Um, it, what that exemption amount will be in 2026 remains to be seen because there's some inflation adjustment factors that have to be taken into effect. But let's say it's six or six and a half million dollars in 2026. There's some regulations issued that have already said that if somebody passes away today, like the wife did in 2022, and while there's this increased exemption period and husband makes the uh, files the estate tax return elects that the 10 million dollars over 12 minute million dollar exemption will be you know added to the husband's exemption amount that huge exemption amount that the wife didn't use that now the husband can use it's not going to be reduced when this exemption what's called sunsets in 2026. So a lot of people are going to be caught off guard because a spouse is going to die. There's a $12 million exemption. 
Um, the coupled has nowhere near $12 million. And so they just say, you know what, not applicable to us, don't need to go through the trouble of filing a tax return. However, um, surviving spouses exemption will likely be less as long as they live for a few years and surviving spouses estate will likely grow because estates grow over years. So it is really important, even with a one, two, three million dollar estate, somebody dying now, I think it is is really important for that surviving spouse to consider filing the estate tax return and making that portability election. So uh, that's my point of the day. This is my shortest um if you've got any questions, you better throw them in the chat right now because I'm fixing to take off kind of a TGIF moment for me. But uh, next week, my plans are I'm going to have, uh, you know, four o'clock central time every day. I do want to have a couple of power of attorney discussions next week. Feel free to check the community tab, maybe Monday morning and see what the what the schedule looks like. And because uh, a lot of we've had a lot of chat about. My sister was named on mom's power of attorney. She stole all the money. What do I do? And I just can't answer that question. So I want to talk into about, uh, you know, how to structure powers of attorney and some of that when I'm inca incapacitated stuff so that some of those common mistakes don't, don't get made. We'll talk about that next week. Okay, everybody take care. Thank you. Thank you for your participation. All of you. Y'all have a great, uh, great rest of the day. We'll see you.